Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this second session uh, in the Green Theatre, um, where um, I'm delighted to be hosting again. My name is Lewis Normand. I'm sales manager at a Rugby Warwickshire based nursery called Bernard's Nurseries. Um, big plant fan and wildlife fan, super fan even. Uh, I'm delighted to be here with you today with some uh, top designers and garden makers um, to discuss gardens with nature at heart. Um, we've got a brilliant panel who are um, world renowned. Let's not, let's not make it anything that it isn't world renowned. And uh, I'm gonna ask them to introduce themselves. During the course of our, um, our, our discussion, if you feel to add any questions, please do. And we'll try and address as many of those as we can at the end. So I'll invite our panelists to introduce themselves with their name, the company they work for, their approach to design in general, um, and a little bit about their interests in wildlife, um, maybe favorite animals, plants, etc. Charlotte, can we start with you, please? Hi, my name is Charlotte Rowe. Um, I'm a landscape designer based in London. Um, my company's been going for about 15 years. Um, we started off we've done about 250 gardens and most of the gardens up to about five years ago were town gardens london gardens um we now do about half, more than half our work is larger gardens in the country um and our background i suppose has been interesting because um wildlife is not something that one particularly associates with london particularly with um the kind of clientele we've had um high worth individuals with expensive tastes and wanting a, a beautiful elegant outdoor room so putting a pile of wood in the corner um, to attract wood lice and my one of my favorite animals which is a stag beetle i love stag beetles is not going to go with the outdoor room feel so um i've got some quite good stories about that um and i could talk about that later but i have got the issue that sometimes if i have particularly an american client they might say to me, oh, you know, we really want lots of lavender and things like that, but we don't want any bees. Uh, and so that means you can't put um, lavender in the garden, they want lavender and they don't really understand why. And uh, because I have bees, and I think it's because in America they have these killer bees. I don't think they realise they're actually quite important. So, um, as I said, um, I've always loved stag, stag beetles and they're almost extinct now. Um, I don't think you find many of those in Hammersmith where I'm sitting now, sadly, but they used to be around. Um, I'd love to be able to uh, introduce some of my clients to the idea that wildlife is important. And as I say, I'll tell a story later, which indicates that I do have some problems in that area. But um, last thing I'll say is our style is probably very good hardscaping, good structure. Um, we design off the house if it's a town garden. We use a lot of rectilinear design. Um, but we are very heavy on the planting and we're doing more and more gardens where we're encouraging people not to have lawns and to have planting instead of lawns to bring the green in. That's me. Interesting. Ben, over to you, please. Hi. Hello, everybody. I'm Ben West. Um, my company is Landscaping Solutions. We, um, we established in 2005. Um, we design and build and maintain in London and the southeast and um, we well I, I'm, I'm I'm from the Midlands but I moved down south about 15 years ago and it was uh, just really for me at the time it was about setting up a business um, and making connections and uh, and, and economic reasons trying, tr trying to earn some money but my heart has always been um, with it's, it's always been with wildlife and natural spaces. And uh, from ever since I was a kid, I've been interested in um, landscapes, um, natural wild landscapes, and um, particularly birds since I was a kid, insects, uh, plants, badgers for a while. I was really into, but fish, uh, you, you name it. I was, I was really, really passionate and into it. And so, um, I just found after we got the business established, I was I was really starting to get frustrated with the kind of work we were doing. I don't know if it was because we were in London and the southeast, and as Charlotte's just said, the type of clients we were 
we were kind of attracting and they wanted outdoor rooms. I was getting sick of creating these. We were doing very, you know, high end stuff and it's, we do it to a good standard, but um, I was kind of starting to get disillusioned with the, the demands that were being put on us. I think not just by the client, but also the industry and that it's, it's a, it's a feedback loop. And uh, I wanted to do stuff that's more passionate. So um, that's the way I want to take the business forward now. That's, that, 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 um, that, that's where my passions lie. And I feel that the last few years, people are really switching on to this and heads have turned and hopefully, I mean, there's still a lot of, there's still a lot of resistance, but um, that's the way I, I really want to push the business now towards and, and and nature is the wildlife is the theme yeah um well i mean we i want to reconnect people to to the fact that we are nature you know we seem to we seem there seems to be a split between um between humanity and 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 the rest of nature and i, I think we've lost the way there and i think mm. that's that's really worrying and <clears throat> for me the path back to that the one of the paths back to that is through gardens so um, I want to really explore that and push that forward and, and disseminate that kind of information. Brilliant, thank you. Jelaine. Hi, I'm Jelaine Rickards and I'm delighted to be here today because what a subject, what a hot topic we're going to be talking about today. Um, I run my own design practice in North London, so I'm predominantly based, uh, most of my gardens are North London or the home counties and again similar to Charlotte a lot of them are town city gardens and then recently as well branching out into sort of more larger uh, areas where of course that is more it's much easier to um, to incorporate a wider range of biodiversity within a larger space so that's that's um, absolutely true and that's joyful to me when I moved from Cornwall I grew up in Cornwall um, and I moved to London when I was 20 so I've been here for quite a time, quite a long time. Um, but my my um, inspiration has always been the natural landscape. And you know, when I lived in Cornwall, I lived in quite a remote part of Cornwall, where we were just kind of left as kids to um, to investigate our our natural environment. I lived on a farm in the middle of nowhere, so my days were spent, you know, sitting on rocks, watching the clouds go by, lifting up stones, and seeing what was underneath it. Or Sitting Why did you leave that? watching the fish, <laughs> and that was, that was my upbringing. So I always felt very connected with that, and, and also um, a place of solace. So if anything bad ever happened, we could always, I could always take myself back out to nature, and it always felt quite healing to me. Then moving to London, lo losing touch with that altogether, really, because of the urban environment we're in, um, and I think with um, people like Sir David Attenborough bringing highlighting. The natural world back to the public again has really engaged me in my own relationship with nature and where I'm trying to go with that. So I spend a lot of my time now educating my clients on why we need to increase biodiversity within any garden um, and then once I've done that we the majority of my designs now are very much based about increasing biodiversity, supporting the local wildlife in, in all sorts of ways. And we can do things in London. Um, we can't do as much as we can in the countryside for sure, but we can certainly do quite a lot and have an impact as well. So at the moment, that's really where I'm driving my business and I'm not taking on clients who don't get that. Brilliant, thank you. And finally, Matt. Hello everybody, um, I'm Matt Childs um, and I have my own design practice, Matthew Charles Design, um, based in Rygate now um, for the last eight years, having moved out of, out of London. Um, a little bit like Jelaine, I'm really a country boy at heart, having grown up in rural Shropshire and the, the valleys of Wales. So have all of those similar kind of experiences that Jelaine talked about from childhood. Um, and I think moving back out to semi-countryside in Surrey now, um, I, I kind of am starting to feel that just through my own garden, that reconnection with nature and totally agree with Ben that I think that gardens are a, a fantastic opportunity to reconnect. Funnily enough, I've been on a bit of a, a learning or a, a, I've kind of been, I've changed my mind since I've been designing since 2010 
In the beginning, I kind of rebelled a little bit about against recycling and sustainability in garden design. I didn't want to make walls with glass bottles in or stuff cages with straw and things. Um, but now I feel we're in a position whereby there are so many other ways that we can kind of approach uh, sustainability and biodiversity without it needing to be too worthy. So um, I'm really, really excited about this topic. And I think because my, my, my approach to design is very much about putting people first at the heart. I'm very much about designing gardens that engage people emotionally, that they're gonna love and spend lots of time in. And I believe if you design a garden that does that, all of the other benefits around wildlife and a garden having longevity and all of these kind of things follow. So that's probably where I come at things a, a little bit differently um, uh, in terms of my approach, but um, I really am starting to campaign more about the importance of wildlife in the garden. Brilliant. I've just seen a little comment here from the very cheeky Fiona Silk who said to you, Matt, uh, it's nice to see Matty's dressed up for the occasion. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Fiona. Thank you for that. <laughs> okay, so we'll, we'll start with our first question. Uh, I'm going to ask Jelaine. Um, the environment, it's fair to say, has taken quite a beating in recent years. Um, and despite lots of efforts to um, aid both the, the global environment and local environments and, and uh, native, well, native animals, plants, and wildlife, um, we we're still seeing an increased decline in abundance, as it's described. Um, what do you do specifically with your clients to encourage wildlife? How do you sell them on the idea? Well, um, luckily, this is quite a topic at the moment. So majority of clients are already thinking about things like that anyway, or at least they're aware of the situation, the plight of our, of our wildlife in the UK. So the conversation is had immediately upon the phone. When I first talk to the client, we discuss this immediately anyway. So we, we get that as a platform. But then we have to think about what does the site offer? Um, what are we trying to do in the site? What, what are we trying to do in the site? What, what are we trying to help? What are we trying to protect? What are we trying to encourage? Um, because if you've got a sunny site, then it's no good trying to encourage woodland habitat for that. So it's very much trying to work out what, what you're trying to do there, what does the site offer. Um, and I think we need to think of it more as a whole as well, rather than just this is one particular garden and what can we do in this one garden. So what have the neighbours got if we're talking about a, a town garden? What have the neighbours got? What can we do to connect this space with another space so that we're starting to encourage wildlife corridors, for example, hedgehogs really need to have a long corridor to, to be able to survive well. Um, and we can do things like putting in fences with a hole in it, or rather than a fence, maybe we can use a hedge as a barrier instead. So there's all sorts of nitty gritty bits of detail that we can put in along the line. But I think the overall concept has really got to be stop thinking of your own little plot as your own little plot. And let's open it up, let's broaden this up and try to um, support not just stuff in your own garden, but what else can we support locally as well. And so initially it's a lot of research. It's a lot of research to find out what's around locally, um, what's in decline locally, and what we can do to, to encourage all of that. Um, I often find that through the design work, um, an important topic of maintenance afterwards comes up. Um, because you can design with all sorts of lovely plants which will support a huge amount of wildlife or insect life or bird life or if you can get frogs and toads and newts then great. Um, but then if you have the maintenance very spick and span, so you have, you know, your leaks blown away <laughs> every week, or if you, um, you know, take away every piece of wood that's fallen down from a tree, then you're declining environment for all sorts of creatures. So um, I was just the Bali AM when I had a wonderful speaker called uh, Ken Blythe from a company called EcoSudis. And one of his comments was a bit of messy chaos is very beneficial for a wildlife. And that's really what I've adopted now. So 
we have to think about clients not chopping down all the perennials as soon as they start looking awful. Let's leave the seed heads on. So quite often the design will be as you would expect. You do your research, you find your plants, you, you support as much as you can, but actually the lead into maintenance afterwards I think is very important and how they manage their gardens afterwards is very important. Before I extend that question to the rest of the panel, do you find, um, you're talking about linking gardens so that you can allow, say, the hedgehog movement through multiple garden spaces. Have you been able to connect multiple garden owners to one principle? Uh, yes, you can have a conversation with people. And if, you, if, you have, if you're lucky enough to have a client who gets on with their neighbours, then absolutely right, yes. Um, but in, sometimes in London, that's not possible. So, you can, so therefore, sometimes you can, only, you can only do that for your own boundary. But if you have, for example, uh, a tree one side of the garden and a tree the other side of the garden, if you put a tree in the middle garden, in the garden that you're designing, then you're automatically connecting things up. So there's other ways that you can do that. But I mean, hopefully, if you've got good neighbours, then you can really make more of an impact for sure. Brilliant. Charlotte, can I extend that to you, please? Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting what you said, because it's nothing like looking at hedgehogs at night going across. It's fantastic. <laughs> Um, and in an ideal world, I think what you do is fantastic, actually, that you speak to them about it. Um, and in certain parts of London, you could do that. One of the problems is the converse of this is the wildlife that's not wanted, and that's the urban fox and the squirrel. And the urban fox is such a problem um, because, well, they're, they're, they shouldn't be in London anyway, poor chaps, and they're, I don't think having a very nice time, generally. Um, they're hated, and they, you know, people try and get rid of them. We put up wiring and all that kind of stuff that makes it really difficult to i can't imagine with some of my clients saying they'll say to me oh i've got this bloody fox living at the end of the garden it's you know it's cubs and terrible noise at night blah 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 so you try and help them and keep the fox away you put lighting in we do garden lighting i'm afraid some people disapprove of that i know that and then the the baby cubs dig <laughs> dig up the fittings and all that kind of stuff um i would love to be able to have hedgehogs going across gardens i think it's fantastic but I just, I worry that certainly in central London, not, not, in, not sort of in the outer suburbs where the gardens are larger, that's just going to be really difficult to achieve. And I'm just throwing that in because it is an issue. Yeah, no, absolutely. But what, what in, that, I think that's pretty much we have to accept that it's going to be difficult to encourage the, the, the preferred wildlife without, <laughs> yeah. you know, while still yeah. including the less desirables. Um, but what do you? What would you do in your work to encourage your clients towards being wildlife conscious in in, in design? Well, the first thing is, like I, I, I probably don't do as much as Jane is doing. But for example, um, we get lots of calls, like she does, I'm sure, saying um, my garden is blah blah blah. I want this. If they mention the word aspirator, we just say, I'm really sorry, we don't we, we don't work with that. So we do have certain barriers and things we just, and that's partly an aesthetic thing and partly I can't stand this stuff and I don't see the point of it. Um, I try and encourage more of my clients to actually have planted gardens rather than lawn and paths. I don't see the point of lawns in lots of gardens. It's fine if you've got lots of kids and they're tumbling around and stuff. We always try and encourage people to have, as I say, smaller areas of paving or gravel, gravel ideally, um, and a lot of planting in the gravel and uh, planted, planted areas. Uh, that's probably the main thing I do because my view is that um, my clients may be bankers and QCs and stuff like that and lawyers, um, but certainly when we go in and do a garden and transform it from a very contemporary, rather bare, cold, brutal uh, environment, um, we know that we bring in much, we, we introduce them to planting probably for the first time. And this is particularly true of overseas clients who really don't understand. They don't come from the, the English thing where we all love our gardens. So I don't think I'm going as far as some people are, but I know that we are stopping a lot of AstroTurf and um, porcelain, can't bear porcelain, porcelain gardens. Um, so maybe I don't do as much as I should do. We certainly do with our clients in the country. That's completely different. I'm still talking about the 40% of our work being in London, that it is a bit of an issue. Mm -hmm. um, and as I say, I'll talk about, you know, how I, well, I can talk about it now. One of the problems we have is we did a garden in North London 
many years ago now, a lovely client, both from overseas, actually they were from um, Israel, in fact. Um, and we, they wanted me to dig out the whole of the garden and it was about three meters dig out. And I said, it looked like a, a, a squash court if you do that. So I managed to persuade them to only dig out about a third of the garden. Because as you know, in North London, a lot of the gardens are quite sloped. Mm -hmm. um, and we've struggled through, they were really nice. The hubby, the husband in the, in the partnership was quite sort of excitable. So it was quite a tricky project. And at the end, we finished the garden, we were doing the sign off. And he said, so Charlotte, um, when are you going to spray the garden? And I said, um, what, what do you mean spray? He said, well, in our garden in Tel Aviv, we always spray with like a DNT type thing to get rid of snakes and insects. And I just said, um, well, we don't have snakes in London, first of all. But I then had to explain to him that actually we really need those insects. And I suddenly realized, spent the last four months working with this client, and they really didn't understand at all what a garden is and that's my problem we don't have people like that very often but that was a classic example of a garden just being an outdoor room yeah yeah that's, that's an interesting point ben what have you observed and what do you try and do to uh, direct your clients towards thinking about wildlife uh, you need to demute yourself yeah. how how do you deal with that level of disconnection um, is is the question? Um, if you if you can't if you can't make a bridge back to back to some some way of connecting those clients back to nature, um, I, I do you know th this is the whole this is the whole basis of of, of the concern that we've got on a, on a really wider scale. If you if you don't have a connection to nature, you're not going to go monkeys about it. Your kids aren't going to care about it. You you just not, there's there's going to be nothing there. There's going to be no one to care about the environment in the future. So for me, it's um, it's really about creating those connections, and they come with uh, some kind of uh, some kind of meaningful um, emotional connection. Um, I I I personally got it when I was a kid. Um, but we gardens are the places that we can do it in. So um, my approach is to be regenerative. Um, and I, but I think before we before we even go down that route, we've got to look at how how and why people are disconnected. And I think it's for people in the industry now to start setting the tone of what gardens are and should be. Um, because if you look at any images in, in the, you know, in a, a, any image that is put forward by suppliers or, um, you know, trade bodies, they tended to be towards very high end, non porous, clean, sanitized outdoor rooms, basically, mm -hmm. as, as Charlotte's been, been talking about. So it, for, for me, it's about changing that perception and making what is desirable also the same as what is sustainable and regenerative. Matt had a very good point earlier, I think, and we can't lose sight of this. And it's something that I think we've learned, we, we could, I've learned from, from sort of following the work of Nigel Dunnett, and that is um, that gardens have got to be joyous. They've got to work for humans. It's, it's, it's a vital point. If they don't, you know, if, if they're not working for the people that are paying for them and, and desiring them, then they're not going to they're not going to tell their friends about them. They're not going to want more of these spaces. So they have to be they have to be. I think Nigel's used the word joyous. You know, they've got to be uplifting spaces that people can people can work in as well as humans as well as um, as well as wildlife. So I think a really key thing is um, is is somehow twisting that aesthetic so that it it becomes what I, what I would call the the sustainable aesthetic. So, you know, and and and, um, and Charlotte has just mentioned porcelain. I think it's a very, very good example. You know, we need more porous surfaces. So instead of lots of concrete walls that are clad in tiles, for example, um, gabions, um, dry stone walls, they're, they're just as just as beautiful. Um, we, we can we can do so much with them. But if you've got non-porous um, surfaces, you know, nothing can really exist on them. These these are sterile, these are sterile landscapes. 
we need to, we need to have lots more nooks and crannies i think in the garden but the challenge is how you how you balance that with the demand of the client you know if you've got someone who wants a who wants who wants a really an outdoor room it's i, I find that the biggest challenge i think that's really tricky mm. okay matt what do you think easy sell uh so for me i actually find this whole um aspect of climate change and sustainability uh, in relation to what we do in the landscape industry really exciting i'm trying not to focus up on it as being a barrier or a restriction because actually mm. i think it's a real commercial opportunity for us i think that lots of people in the world feel kind of frozen in terms of what they can do in order to do their bit to um, combat climate change um, and actually the garden is a perfect place to start with doing your bit so i think we should be seeing ourselves as being in a great position to be able to leading to be leading the way and providing a solution to all of these environmental problems um but i i almost think we should see ourselves as a green army but a slightly more co slightly more covert kind of operation whereby rather than going out there and being so worthy and needing to beat people over the head with a stick and say you need to do this and do that I believe that there's actually a lot that we do in the garden that is beneficial to wildlife anyway. So when I'm thinking about wildlife when I'm designing, for example, my first thing is all about all year round interest in the garden. And I know that in order to provide all year round interest through planting, I'm looking at, you know, foliage, I'm looking at flower, I'm looking at berries, all kind of things that are going to be good for wildlife but are also great for people aesthetically and sensory to, to look at in the garden um, and I think we often when you look at a lot of the RHS campaigns around pollinators and that kind of thing it's all very much focused on summer flower and getting all of your lavender as Charlotte said into the garden but actually that isn't when wildlife is struggling at its most and I'm more interested in these other periods in the year such as winter um, and how you can really bolster habitat for wildlife then. So I'm really at the moment excited about uh, winter flowering shrubs. Things like sarcococca, for example. For me, it's the first thing in the year that brings a smile to my face. I think, oh, it's so gloomy and awful. But look, you know, the garden is starting to wake up. But actually, that is a brilliant source of pollen and nectar at a time when it's in very short supply for insects. So all things like that, viburnums, hamamelas, um, and then bulbs, obviously, you know, your crocus, your snowdrops, all things at that time of year when we need to be supporting a lot more. And then the other thing I think about with wildlife, just quickly, is um, when we talk about the abundance of wildlife and diversity. Again, I think we focus very much on our bees and butterflies, which are very important, but there's so many other forms of wildlife. And I've really got into wildlife ponds um, recently, so amphibians and, you know, water snakes and all of the insects that are associated with a pond um, and there's so many great plants we often talk about perennials and grasses and shrubs but actually some of the water uh, loving plants are you know absolutely fantastic in terms of the diversity there and the benefits they can bring to wildlife so from all of your water lilies to all of your submerged kind of weeds um, all of your marginals there's there's so much lovely kind of plants and trendy plants as well um, like butonis for example i could not get hold of that anywhere this year because it's gone really trendy um, as a as a wildlife plant but again that kind of thing but then you might say well lots of people don't like the wildlife ponds because they're high maintenance so i've started to shift back to my core about putting people first and so i'm really getting into wildlife swimming ponds and natural swimming ponds at the moment tick tick wildlife humans so i think i think you know it's about trying to be flexible um, before we move on to the next question i've got then what i want to ask all of you is do you feel that there is a disconnect with most of or what percentage of your client base would you say there is a disconnect between their expectation of, of a garden and it being an environment in which nature can flourish. So um, Charlotte, can we start? And also think about the balance of your clients. Um, yeah. Do you find well, that there is a disconnect? 
Um, well, yeah, there is still a disconnect in London. Um, as I say, about 40% of our stuff's in London now, the rest of it's outside London. And the ones outside London um, may also be people who have a house in London. And it is interesting to see how they view the house, uh, the garden in uh, the country completely differently from the one in London. Okay. But as, but as I, the only thing I was going to say was it is really, really, really heartening when you go in and you transform a space that's basically a whole load of, you know, tiles and a sort of pathetic water feature that doesn't really work properly and some very narrow beds, like 400, 40 centimetre wide beds and a great lawn in the middle. And then you just bring the, just making the beds wider, you know, tripling them or two and a half sizes, you know, the width and putting in more breaks in the garden. And what's so fantastic is that, although I haven't gone in and, created a wildlife garden. I have created a garden that will encourage wildlife because we, like Matt was saying, like seasonal planting. So um, I'd say, unfortunately, I've got a bit of a hard work in London, but not outside London. Mm -hmm. Ben, disconnect, definitely there. Yeah, Clients absolutely. aren't asking for nature. Yeah. Um, increasingly so, I think. Um, if, you, if you're after percentage, 99, I would say, but- um, Really? I think it's huge. Yeah, I, do, I really, I really think it's it's huge, and um, it gets quite tiring um, trying to sort of, you know, you can't. Matt's absolutely right. You can't, you can't bash people over the head with it, and and absolutely, you've got to get, you've got to sort of sneak it in a lot of the time, um, and go under the radar, and and that's that's fine. But um, yeah, I, I mean, it gets. We're trying to shift the business now towards finding the clients that are already on this page, you know, and, uh, and, and possibly that's going to take us out of London and, and, and far beyond. But, um, and, and by the way, if there's any designers out there that um, would like to work with sympathetic um, contractors, you know where I am. But uh, yeah, it, it's, it gets quite tiring and, and, and it gets a bit depressing, you know, kind of um, try, trying to trying to win out win you know win over that mentality and it, they've got to make their own connection somehow we can build the gardens that will help them to do that but it's it's taking that step and moving away from um what we've done over the past i don't know the trends that have been the trends that have been that, that have been gearing people's um people's aspirations for the past i don't know 20 years mm. Will you work in Scotland? I've just seen a question come up from Rachel Bailey saying she'd love to work with you, Ben, but she's in Scotland. Well, the problem with that is, you know, the carbon footprint of uh, traveling up there, you know, you know um, if it was the right project, we would do. I've spoken to Jelaine many times about this and um, she's often asking us to do projects um, up in Hertfordshire and, and sort of, you know, up that side. And it's just a bit out of the way for us. But um, yeah, I think the right projects, absolutely, yeah. But it's yeah, it's it's quite it's it's a big it's a big disconnect, Lewis, for sure. Okay, yeah. Jelaine, um, do you see that in your work? I mean, you, you're you're kind of in top top end of London, moving out into the home counties. So, garden size might be a bit yeah. different. Are are they nature conscious? Uh, I think increasingly so, but it could just be the type of client that I'm now attracting anyway, or or that I will talk to or engage with. Um, I mean, actually, the majority of my gardens are also town gardens or city gardens. I'd say 70, 80% of mine are town gardens. Um, and I agree with Matt and Ben here and that you just can't browbeat people in cities. There's no good sitting here taking the moral high ground. Just do it. It's, you know, if you, if you have your own thoughts in mind about how you can increase the biodiversity within that client's garden. They don't have to know about it. You don't have to be in agreement with it. You just do it anyway. It's <laughs> slightly secret. Yeah. As Matt said, a covert army. I like that, a green covert army. Um, you know, you just do it anyway because that's what really what we should be doing. We have to make a difference. And we're in such a good opportunity um, to be able to make a difference that I feel that we just need to with every garden that we do and we try and make it every decision, try and make it ethically sound, try and make it with biodiversity in sight. But getting back to your question about the percentage wise, I'd say, I don't know, I'm optimistic. I'd say about 70% of my clients now, we have this, this, we have this conversation, um, particularly, particularly when I, I'm very passionate about getting the kids involved here. I think they're going to be our saving grace. And, you know, kids have just got the most amazing ability to want to learn about things. 
and they're fascinated by wildlife. They're fascinated by spiders and creepy crawlies until they get to a certain age when they're told that actually these are horrible things. Um, up until then, they're absolutely fascinated by them. So, you know, for me, we, we can get the kids engaged with the clients. And so quite often if we're having the consultation meeting, I want the kids there. I want to talk to them about stuff like that. I want to show them the plants and I like to get them engaged. And I think that's probably way forward. But I'm optimistic. I'm, I'm telling you that about 70%, 70% or so of my clients at the moment are engaging on that subject. Yeah, that's great. So it could be because that's where you are marketed by the, the virtue of your client base, but at least, I mean, it's been a bit depressing hearing Charlotte and Ben's uh, perspective yeah. on it. Um, can, Matt, can, I, Matt, can, I, can I just say, Lewis, that uh, we, we get more requests to fill in ponds, remove poisonous, potentially poisonous plants, um, dig, dig out florif floriferous turf, um, and, and clear mushrooms from people's lawns and fox prints off people's paving than we ever do people requesting us to put bee friendly plants and log, you know anything that's wildlife friendly. In. That, that's a really interesting point because I suppose it's not just about how you all go to your client but it's also about what your client asks of you without you provoking a question um, and yeah. you know how many are approaching you directly to say look I really want to improve biodiversity um, Matt, you, you seem to have possibly one of the uh, easiest runs of getting um, nature focused design um, into your gardens. Is that because you're covertly doing it or is it something that your clients are requesting? I like the idea that we're all covertly benefiting the environment. I think that's great, you know, really. We should all be covert urban and, and rural greeners and started a new movement <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. I, think, I think it's it's got it's got legs already yeah um, i have to say i'm more on, on jelaine so i'm going to balance things up i'm, I'm similar to jelaine really and i'm a little bit more optimistic but i think as charlotte has mentioned that might be because because my work has shifted from london and urban areas more to the home counties and you know um and rural gardens so um, whereas I probably only do about 10%, I would say, of my work now in, in kind of, you know, kind of urban spaces. Um, so there must be something in there, I think, which allows people to already have a bit more of a connection with nature because of the, the setting they're, they're in, which probably makes it a little easier for me. But what I would say is I think a lot of this probably comes down to trends as well, in that... Um, people like Charlotte who have been so fantastic at doing these beautiful outdoor rooms and, um, you know, because it's, it's very much followed on from the interior space. People have wanted to use their gardens in urban areas. And even now when I go to a, a, a rural garden, people really want the fire pit, they want the swimming pool, they want the pool house, you know, they want all of those kind of things that make their garden an exterior interior interior exterior whichever way around <laughs> um, so that is that is that kind of is, is always very much the approach um, but when I weave in to it all of the planting and they've always told me about low maintenance gardens previously by the end of it I see a real change in behavior and a shift in perception and I see that although clients might have at the beginning been less interested or optimistic about wildlife that very much changes once they've got the garden there in place. Okay. So I think it's, it's again, and that's probably then when the education needs to start to happen. So not at the beginning, let's get that garden in there, get the planting in, and then let's help them maintain it and learn how to, you know, um, to, to support it on, on a long-term basis. Brilliant. Charlotte, do you uh, go to your clients with um, the discussion of wildlife? Is it something that you would bring up specifically, trying to work it into your design development? No, not as much as I should. That's what I think I said, uh, I implied earlier. Um, but I think covertly, I love that word, <laughs> yes, because we won't do AstroTurf. Mm. You won't do a great big, enormous, I, I did when I started, when I started 15 years ago, I just did very clean line, you know, blah, blah. But increasingly we put more and more planting in. And um, <clears throat> often you go to a garden and particularly in London where you've got an enormous lime tree in the next door garden and it's got all the sticky stuff that comes, you know, we know all about that. 
and that puts people off trees because they're not allowed to remove them if it's a conservation area. We put a lot of trees in gardens, but we put trees in gardens that fit that garden. So we quite famously use a lot of multi-stem trees, which can be kept quite small, but they're you know, they, they really create zones and vi visual sense of perspective in the garden. And they also, very importantly, we don't really, very rarely do we put evergreen ones in because we don't really think they work. But they're normally deciduous and we always, this is when we first start talking right at the beginning about autumn colour, berries, blossom, all the things we know are really important. Most of these clouds wouldn't have a, they really don't have a tree. They, to them, they'll see someone who's got, um, uh, Magnolia grandiflora pleached in London, which looks ridiculous anyway, and far too close to the house. And they'll say, oh, you know, I like that. And I said, well, it doesn't really work. It's not the right plant for the right place. Um, so I, I think we can take credit at least, even if we have done quite a lot of contemporary um, style outdoor rooms, we can take credit for the fact that we do a lot of, of planting generally, mm. very little evergreen planting. I, I can't bear gardens that just look the same all year, how boring. And what that's done is people who really hadn't looked at gardens much at all, and of course last year has been fantastic for people looking at their gardens more and using them more. They got, they said, God, I had no idea that if you put a, you know, a fagus or a hornbeam hedge in somewhere, look at the colouring and look at those trees. They can't believe it. So I suppose, um, I'm going to be more optimistic um, and say I think we probably are behind our words of yes we'll do that for you, we'll do that for you, we'll give you a nice play area, a nice fire pit, blah blah blah, outdoor eating. Actually what we are doing is pushing them to use their gardens more and to look at their gardens more and at the same time you know giving the blackbirds somewhere to nest which they wouldn't have if they didn't if we didn't have really nice big climbers and ivy we don't do ivy very often in london but big climbers big mature climbers big multi-stem trees big trees that encourage the birds to come in um so i think most a lot of my class first view of a bird would be a pigeon and pigeon spikes you know don't want any pigeons here but I think we are starting to, we certainly like Jelaine, we just don't take on stuff that's completely an, the antithesis. To, I mean, we turn down so much work and it's mm. mainly because it's just not what we want to do. I mean, yeah. So well, I, I think um, we're maybe better than we thought I thought I was. But Yeah, no, absolutely. By declining um, to do things, I think you're also effectively, well, you're possibly just passing it on to someone who will do it, but you're, yeah. you're hopefully you're acknowledging that you have uh, you know, a principled stand on 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 certain materials and resources. Um, we, yeah, we turn fact, down much more work than we even go and see. I mean, massively more. So that's good. Yeah. People working here. Oh my god, we're turning another piece of work now. Yeah, <laughs> we won't do those things. In terms of the countryside, would you have a conversation more with your clients there on yeah. how to bring nature in? Yeah, yeah, definitely absolutely. more of that. Uh, yeah, I mean, absolutely. And the fact that they've got a garden. They want in the country but it's completely different kettle fish and uh, also there you can sneak things in as ben was saying you just sneak in a wood pile it's quite easy really isn't it um you know you don't you make sure they don't make everything too beautiful and finished and you know we always have a wildish area it's not necessarily meadow meadow grass uh, wildflower meadows though but you know people they're lovely but they're a lot of maintenance and mm -hmm. i'm afraid some of my clients just won't spend the money and it is money to maintain one of those and it's such a shame we'd love to do them more we just keep rough gar grass you know even if it doesn't look brilliant um mm -hmm. we take a few thistles out but we do actually always have a wild area yeah always well certainly more diverse than yeah. than, than clipped lawns then um when do you have this conversation do you do you really openly and aggressively i suspect that this is a yes because of the way you're focusing. Well, um, it's not aggressive. <laughs> <laughs> Persuasively. Um, well, it, it will come in as part of, okay, so you've got the CDM process. So for us now, it's integrated into that process. Mm. Um, and it's a consideration just as much as a health and safety consideration is, you know? There's, there's a, um, it, almost like a, a sort of, um, you know the you know the biodiversity net gain um, thing that's coming in. Mm -hmm. 
Um, it's kind of like that, but probably with more teeth because we can actually make sure it happens. Um, but you've got to, you know, your, your clients have got to be on board. We can offer clients options for different different levels of um, of kind of wildlife friendliness. But um, it's yeah, it's coming in right from the outset, and then th that's before you know um, that's that's before we've really spoken to the client necessarily on a on a on this, on this level. But I think I, I really tread, I, I'm not aggressive. I tread, you've got to tread lightly because um, it's a client's garden. So we have yeah. to, we've got to meet their requirements, you know, otherwise you, you're you not going to get, you're not going to get any work. Um, but, but you're also tailoring your work in the direction of um, a, a more di like ecologically diverse and sound practice. So if we, if, if we get a free rein, yes. It then becomes what I would call a, it's a step beyond sustainability if we can, because we've got, you know, it's, it's well documented all the losses that we've got in the wider, wider countryside, that is especially, especially ag heavy agriculture, you know, intensive agriculture. So we, we have got an opportunity on a smaller scale to, to redress that balance in gardens. I've, I've seen it, I've experimented in my own garden, so I know what can happen. But as Jelaine alluded to earlier, you you have to have if you've got little patchwork a garden here a garden there it's better than having a, a sterile garden but you have to somehow marry all these different gardens up and I think that comes with a bigger sort of top-down shift from what again coming back to that aesthetic that we that we put forward as designers as professionals as industry bodies we've got to kind of that will help to link people together because then that becomes what's desirable. Yeah, I think, but we keep coming back to what's desirable in London seems to be low maintenance outdoor rooms. But we've got to think bigger than just London, remember, of course, because yeah, I'm kind of we're, we're, we're um, talking to the whole of the UK here and possibly yeah, so, further afield. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just I'm just hung up on that. My my experiences really. Um, so if you've yeah, if if you've got a free reign to do what you will, um, you you can you can start to implement should you wish the regenerative approach matt talked earlier about his his larger gardens that are incorporated they still want to incorporate fire pits um, and, and perhaps barbecue areas and all the, all the kind of features that you might want in there as a functional garden i think you you've got to then look at you, you can look at the materials that you're using then are they you know, are they are they the best materials we can use from a kind of a, a regenerative um, standpoint or a sustainable standpoint? And you would then be looking at the where those materials were coming from, you know, mm. whether local or imported. You'd also be, you know, looking at the porosity of the actual materials that you're using. Um, uh, so, so you, I don't think you need to get rid of those features necessarily. I think you just need to put a lot of thought into where the materials are coming from and how they how they weather into the landscape. Because I'm seeing a lot of the stuff that we've done and, and also being able to maintain the gardens. A lot of the gardens that we've done, we can see that how these how these sort of what I call sort of uh, glitzy materials um, they don't really weather well into into the British landscape. You know, and you've got really pale porcelains, really pale sawn sandstones. They don't, they're not, they're not what I would call a sustainable aesthetic. And if that makes any sense. No, absolutely. Yeah. And actually, interestingly, I'm seeing the comments being made at the time. And while we've got a number of questions that are coming in, there's also lots of comments. There's a chat room discussion going on at the same time. And a lot of the discussion is, is, considering materials yeah. and the, um, the, the, the sort of ethical nature of using certain materials, um, uh, as well as thinking about plants, thinking about wildlife themselves. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's part of a bigger picture. We'll probably come back to that in a second. But I want to ask Jelaine if she, um, how early in the conversation she is getting stuck into those clients and asking them, you know, where, what's your position on nature and what do you want to do? Can you hear me, Jelaine? Sorry, you've got a little fuzzy. Did you just pick that? Oh, sorry. So I, I, I'm asking you the same question about where do you start your conversation with the clients on 
nature on bringing wildlife in? Um, is, it, is it right at the beginning? Are you really engaging with them early doors? Yeah, it really is. I mean, as I said before, it's, it's a conversation that I have with them on the phone before I even do any work, before I even go and meet them. It's, that's a subject that's already brought in. Then I will tell them that this is my ethos, this is what I do, this is how I practice. And actually, I find it wins me work. I find that this is, this is something that people are really into and they really want to do it and they don't know how. They've just got a little back garden or whatever, and what can they do? Um, so I find that actually it helps me win work. And, you know, there's a garden I designed in NW7 and all right, it is, it is surrounded by a few fields. So we have got a borrowed landscape and we have got borrowed wildlife. But, you know, in his garden, there's a little natural pond, which he's got frogs and newts in. Um, every time we had to take it down a tree, so I replaced it with five others. We've got loads of trees in that garden now. We've got a deer and we've got rabbits in there, which are a bit of a nuisance. But, you know, this is London. So, you know, we can achieve these things if we put our minds to it. I've also got a job in um, Hertfordshire at the moment where the client's got a 12 acre plot. I'm not designing the whole lot. I, I think I'm doing about two, three acres. But their remit was that they wanted to plant lots of trees and they wanted to increase the biodiversity within their plot. And it's like, thank you. <laughs> you know, thank you very much. I had to fight for that job, but I got it. But, and I think I got it because that, was my, that is my commitment at the moment. This mm. is my commitment and this is where I want to take my business. And I think it gave me the edge perhaps. Um, but also, interestingly, I'm also doing a tiny, tiny garden in Hampstead, literally around the corner from Hampstead Tube. It's the tiniest, it's the smallest garden I've ever done. And I was approached by the um, developer's project manager, and I had that conversation with him. I said, fine, okay, you haven't got much room for planting, but there's other things that we can do within this garden too, and this is my ethos, and this is how I do things. And he went, oh, yeah, yeah, fine, right, all right, and it just didn't go in. But they had to get the garden through planning. So it's part of the development. So it's a, it's a one story property and then they're digging down two levels, two basement levels. Um, so what are we going to do with all the water? It's got nowhere to go. Um, we know we are, they're also cantilevering out a whole a section of patio and putting underneath it a load of generators and air conditioning units and pumps and God knows what. So I said, well, you know, we have to do something with this water. So we are draining all the water off now into a ground, into an underground storage tank and we're using it for the irrigation system. And I thought that, I thought that's really great, you know, and the, and the property developer said to me, the planners will love that, that's brilliant. I thought, like, okay, all right, we, you know, we're coming at it from different angles, but we're still being able to make a difference. We are still being able to do stuff. And although it's a tiny plot, we can still green it up with as much um, biodiversity is possible for that. And it was interesting, actually, I heard, again, it was um, Kane Bly saying that there is expected to be, I think it might even be the law now, a 10% biodiversity net gain on all new developments. And I just think that's very encouraging. And mm. really, you know, we need to bang the drum about it. And I think if you're passionate about it, you drag people with you anyway. Um, and yeah, as I said, I think it wins me work. Yeah, so I mean, I think you're absolutely right. Passion is always going to um, attract followers and probably people who are maybe like-minded but not necessarily informed. Who, whose responsibility is it to um, encourage people to want to garden for wildlife? Where, where, do, we, um, where do we begin here? Well, I mean, I think as a designer, I have a huge responsibility, not just to my clients, to try and educate them if they want to be educated, but certainly to, as we've said before, include stuff in their gardens, whether they know it or not. But actually, we're, we, we need to apply pressure to, the, um, to our suppliers as well. And I'm increasingly asking, I was, in, I was um, asked by a supplier this morning, would you like to have a look at my product? And so, okay. How much plastic content has it got? What's the carbon footprint of it? And we need to be asking those questions. We need to be asking the nurseries, where are they? What are they doing with all these plastic pots? Can we not have them in something other than plastic pots? Or if they are, can we not have them black so we can recycle them? And we need to be putting pressure on people like that. So, so I think from an education point of view, we can do a lot, but then who educates us? We need to know as well. We, you know, like, you know, if you ask a supplier, what's your carbon footprint? Well, they'll answer you in a way that you don't necessarily understand. 
Mm. So, you know, there needs to be some, and I think probably it has to be government led, although I don't have much hope for that. Um, but as I said, I'm the positive person about this. People are interested, people want to make a difference. And I think it's to do with people like David Attenborough waking people up to actually the, the terrible situation that we're in now. And we, have, we all have a moral responsibility to actually do something about this. And you mentioned children being a good advocate. Um, and I think obviously, if we can encourage our children to be um, much more wildlife and um, uh, ecologically focused, that, that will stand us in better stead in the future, perhaps too late, but um, it, you know, it's, we've got to maintain generations worth of future interest as well. Matt, do you um, have a, a great deal? We've, we've all heard the same um, story that Charlotte heard with having um, a desire to plant lavender, but no desire to see bees. I think it's, I mean, it's certainly something from a nursery perspective that I've encountered many times. And when I was designing gardens, exactly the same, often with lavender being the exact example. Um, so I'm sure there's not a person here that hasn't heard that. How do you, how do you, do you change that? How do you educate your client and whose responsibility is it to you know, get that education out there? Yeah, it, it's baffling, isn't it? Well, I find it baffling that people really do feel like that's about wildlife and, and insects in the, in the first place. Um, I think for me, um, the way I go about um, wildlife in design is that I'm very much a salesman and right from the very beginning, I'm all about vision. And mm. I think the thing that for me is really important is that I always say an interior space, which is static and set, is very different to the outside space, which is living, it's changing, it's growing, it's moving. There's light, there's shade and all these kind of things. And there's wildlife. So for me, I always kind of create or try to create this tapestry, tapestry in the conversation where wildlife is a positive. It's yeah. something which is, which is of, of value. However, I have had clients that have, have kind of stumped me right at the beginning. A similar story, Ben was talking about filling in wildlife ponds. One of my clients once, um, her husband, who is very high up in a senior kind of CEO role and um, quite formidable, ha actually had a phobia of frogs and really kind of had nightmares about this riveting, riveting sound that he had out in the garden. So before I got there, they'd filled in a great big wildlife pond. Mm. So for me, that's kind of like, oh, you know, it kind of makes your heart sink. Um, so... I think we have to be realistic and we have to be fair to our clients. Like I said at the beginning, we need to make this garden work for people. So if it is somebody that I feel in that initial conversation is up for wildlife, I'll go whole hog. And I think it is then about changing aesthetic as we've talked about before. So it really is about creating a garden that is looser, that is more about planting. It's about kind of allowing areas to be more wild. Um, and also trying to reduce the amount of hard landscaping so that we've got more um, permeable surfaces, less concrete. I saw there was a comment came up in the chat before. How do we all feel about concrete? Concrete Don't is- jump in and ask the questions. I'm doing that in a bit. Oh, sorry, sorry. sorry. You're, you're jumping uh, the gun, man. Okay, Come I will go on to that one. I'll let you do that one later. <laughs> but um, so, I, so, I, so for those clients, I kind of, um, kind of will, go all hog, then if I've got somebody like the client I described before, who I know has got some phobias about wildlife, I'll take inspiration from before, and very much like say from the 18th century landscape movement, where it was all about closer to the house, allowing things to be a little bit more formalized and a little bit kind of safer. Um, but then as you move away, then trying to encourage, uh, you know, there to be a little bit more of this looseness and, and wildlife kind of aspect that I was talking about. So I think it's a, it's a tactical approach. It really is about tactical. And it's not about trying to turn anybody off, in my opinion, and say you're wrong. It's about how can I work with, with you and bring you along on this sustainability, biodiversity journey um, so that by the end of it, hopefully I've changed your mind and your, your behaviour. Mm. I, I also think that this shouldn't be so much down to us as an industry as well. So... When I think about my commercial clients, often I'm in a really good position there because planning with new developments has already kind of put lots of stipulations in, 
where they know that they have to put biodiversity in, they have to do things for wildlife in order for the development to, to go ahead. So yeah. it's kind of a win-win. And I almost feel that we need some support like that in the residential sector, whereby, as Ben was talking, in terms of the biodiversity net gain, there almost needs to be some kind of point system whereby you know, we, people can be attributed kind of biodiversity or environmental points as a result of doing good things in their garden. Um, or there needs to be some kind of regulations, like with suds that were brought in for driveways to, to make sure we have permeable surfaces. Why aren't there similar kind of things with regards to, to gardens, as we know they're such an important part of the sustainability solution? In the form of a planning permission? Well, um, I'm not sure that works um, unless it's a new development. Mm. Uh, if it's a new development, yes, definitely. I think that should be applied to, to new developments, whether they're residential or commercial. But I, I kind of, I don't know what the solution is, but I feel, as I said before, people out there want to do their bit. They want to do something. Can we not get creative about, you know, by doing these positive things, here are some kind of, you know, brownie points for your sustainability contribution. Mm. Um, and I'm not exactly sure what that is or how it works, but um, I think we could be, um, and government could be kind of uh, approaching this from a much more um, positive way. I also think if it isn't that, I think commercially, like I said, I think there are lots of benefits to sustainable gardens and um, biodiversity. So, I am now very much about reducing waste that goes off site. Really kind of, AI, and I, I save lots of money for my client that way with less grab lorries and less skips. So trying to incorporate as much of that hardscape that's already there into footings and foundations, reducing the amount that goes off site. Trying to, as um, Charlotte was saying, trying to increase more gravel and permeable surfaces rather than paving. So all these kind of things, they have the win-win for the client of that they're cheaper than the alternative, which is, you know, the status quo that we've always kind of adopted in, in landscaping. Good. Charlotte, um, whose responsibility is this to educate, perhaps not just the client, but everyone, that this is the right way to go? Oh, I'm not sure it's me. Um, <laughs> I, I, uh, it's, it's quite difficult, which what Ben was saying about the commercial aspects of it. Um, and, you know, I don't think it's really our responsibility to completely educate people, but I think we can do a bit of the, the co back to the covert thing again. Mm. Certainly we do talk to clients about materials. Um, we really encourage gravel. I'm afraid some people just will not have gravel because they don't like it on their polished marble floors when they go inside. It's really an annoying because we love gravel because we can put more plants in them. Yeah, I think we should play our part. I think the teachers, the teaching profession are doing a really good job with kids. I think kids are really, as, as I think Jelaine said, our hope really, because they're a lot more educated than we ever were. But then my generation, we did have our stag beetles. We did have these things. It was just kind of, you didn't have smart gardens in those days. You just had gardens and uh, it's all a new world really. And uh, like I was brought up in London and outside London, I feel really fortunate to have that. Some kids have never been to a garden. I mean, there was a um, quite interesting thing on um, uh, what's the program? Well, country, the thing on Sunday nights on the countryside. And they had these kids who had refugees who'd never been to the countryside. And that's true of a lot of people. If you're born in Newnham or Tower Hamlets, you've probably never seen, seen a field, uh, let alone a, a large garden. So, yeah, I mean, we do have our, I think, pair, everybody, I think we should all do it. And I, I have to say, I do think government has got to. It's really crucial. The government's got other things on their mind at the moment, but uh, let's hope the new president-elect will be a little bit different from the old president in the States. That might help a bit in leading the way. I think we've all got a responsibility. Ben, everyone responsible? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm happy to bear responsibility. I think we can, I think we can, disseminate as much information if we're interested and passionate about it we can we can educate ourselves and we can we can get that out to our clients we can write about it we can um we can get it out there on social media there's lots of avenues for us to get the the, the information we need out there um i mean i was i was saw something on twitter yesterday about 
wildfires raging through Argentina. You know, I, I, I didn't know anything about it, but, but, but apparently they've been burning for months. So it, it's kind of, there's lots of, you know, I don't know, we, sh we should, this kind of information needs to get out there and we need people to, to know about it in order for them to be, perhaps, perhaps we need to be a little bit more alarmed. I don't know about, about mm. um, what, what's Sense going on. urgency. Yeah, I think so. You know, when you've got people, you've got, you've got, I'm concerned about it. We need top down because I look at my wife, for example, you know, she, I'm, 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 I'm on to her all, all the time, just about the stuff we do around the house and how we consume and et cetera, et cetera. She needs somebody. And I imagine there's a lot of people like this. She needs somebody in government to stand up or somebody that she, somebody that carries a bit more weight than me, let's say, <laughs> <laughs> to, to be able, you know, and, and, and as soon as somebody comes on in, in front of her on the television, she, she kind of listens to someone in government. And, and I don't think there's enough of that going on. Uh, so yeah, and legislation that Matt talks about. Um, and, you know, are we gonna get that from government? I, I, I'm not going to hold my breath, you know, look at I'm what dedicated the, minister for horticulture has been one of the one of my kind of why have we never had, uh, you know, we've got death from ministers and uh, their focus is often on agriculture. Uh, yeah. but horticulture often goes unnoticed, despite being a very big industry and really important environmentally. Well, it always seems to be belittled, doesn't it? I think, um, you know, the um, I remember David Cameron a few years ago sort of playing that saying something derogatory about gardeners. So, um, yeah. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. OK, so before we sort of head towards questions, I want to ask you all, because we've talked about the theory, we've talked about some practical application in terms of working with your clients. What can everybody do? What one thing can everybody do? in their own garden or in any garden or landscape that they have influence over to actually improve uh, its environmental credentials. Not for the sake of it, but for a real world application. It could be very specific, but what do you think is the way to start? Jelaine, you look like you're about to pounce on an answer. So I'm gonna to go to you first. Oh, I mean, we're just so, so in the plant industry. I mean, it's just, I, I don't know, is it the most obvious answer? Plant the plant. <laughs> plant the plant that makes a difference. Do a little bit of research, you know, mm. work out what you've got, sun, shade, clay, whatever, and, and find out, you know, what's the, Google, what's the best environmentally friendly, what's the best for wildlife for clay or whatever, and just go and buy it and plant it. Simple. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, thank you. Charlotte, what, what's your perspective? What, what one thing would you recommend everybody try to apply? What do you covertly uh, add to the gardens in town? Oh, well, Jane said it, Ruth, genus loci. Um, just have a garden. I mean, look, we're so lucky in this country. Look how many of us have got gardens. If you mm. lived in Paris or Berlin or, you know, wherever, Milan, you wouldn't have a garden at all. So just maximize it and make use of it. I think people who have vegetable gardens on their balconies are just amazing and keep going, do it. Ben, what are you gonna add? I'm gonna say, um, relax, just, just chill out a bit more and don't be too uptight about your garden, you know? Don't intervene too much once, you know, I've found that, I, 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 I experiment a lot in my garden um, with various bits and bobs and, um, I've just found that sort of letting a little bit of uh, Jelaine said the word um, messy, a bit of mess, maybe a bit of chaos, a bit of, bit of um, organized chaos, possibly, um, is really improved the insect. And what it's all about, really, for me, is insects prop everything up, plants and insects prop everything up. So if you can relax a little bit, you will see you will see more insects. And actually, they've helped my youngest kids um, relate to the garden more um because they they're interested in oh what's that what's that grub there what's that what's that caterpillar what's that butterfly is that a bee is it a hoverfly and that's engaged them um and the other thing that's engaged them is growing fruit in the garden um because they'll be out there and fruit and also foliage that tastes nice things like um, they tend to like things like sorrel sorrelly flavors so in you know, oxalis or perhaps um 
run this species. So yeah, um, I think relax a bit more and give the kids some reason to get out there and not necessarily just get on a climbing frame or something, but get their hands in there and have a little, you know, maybe maybe grow something, you know, maybe get the kids to grow some fruit, strawberries, ras raspberries. I can't get them off the raspberries. <laughs> <laughs> okay matt what's your um your big piece of advice yeah i, I think it's just got to be to plant a tree and i know that's quite an obvious one it's not very original but i think um gardens come and go i think we all have this this hang up when we kind of make a garden that's going to be there forever and we know from historical gardens that you know have been recreated that isn't the case they change when it comes to a tree, it really is a long-term investment. And I think it has so much benefit, both in the short term and the long term, in terms of you know, what it takes out of the atmosphere in terms of carbon dioxide, but also all of the benefits it gives us in terms of the shade it creates. And I think we're going to need a lot more of that going forward as, as the climate warms up and everything. So I think if we were all to plant a tree, I think that would be a really a good starting point. Do you, do you feel that there's a point where designing with nature and wildlife in mind starts to compromise the aesthetic, Matt? Um, do, I just don't personally like that approach, like I said to you, because I'm all about not trying to put um, a theme, a theory or anything onto my client. I kind of want to hear from them first what it is that they want. And I really believe that as good garden designers, landscapers, everything, like I said, we really should be integrating all of this into what we do. Sustainability, using sustainability methods, planting um, for wildlife. We can do all of this and it not even be an issue for the client. So um, yeah, I don't see it as a barrier. I see it as something which is a positive and um, something which is commercially, um, uh, a positive um, and just something that we should just do anyway. Jolene, what do you think? Is, can it compromise the aesthetic if we uh, focus too heavily on one theme like nature? Well, um, I, I suppose in theory, yes, it could, but you know, you can still have nice clipped hedges, uh, evergreen hedges, which are good for wildlife. Um, so it doesn't have to, it doesn't have to be a rambling mess of rotting vegetation <laughs> this time of year you know we, we can plant as I think as Matt says you've got to be very much client led and if they like a neat and tidy garden then okay you can select plants that will hold their own it doesn't have to be uh, a mess um, but if you don't mind a bit of messy chaos then <laughs> um, then you know then you've got scope to to leave it I mean personally in my own garden I've gone from from taking up all, every bit of scrap um, to leaving, I've got a huge oak tree at the end of my garden, which is 30 metres tall. Um, the leaf drop is immense. Um, I am now only clear the leaves away on the, on the lawn, which I do have, and also the pathway so I can walk along it. The rest of the stuff is just left and decays away. Um, and come springtime, I just top dress it with some organic matters to help it all rot down. So, you know, and that to me is not horrible. So, but I guess other people it might be. So I think that's right. You have to be very quiet and as to what their expectations are and what they're going to tolerate and then design it around that. Brilliant. Ben, what do you think? Design aesthetic? Yeah, I, I, think, it, I think absolutely it does detract from the aesthetic and I think therein lies the problem. I think about the best, I think about when I've recorded most insect life in my garden is when it's looked completely overgrown. So, um, <laughs> And, and, and that's, you know, what can you do? But that's not necessarily unbeautiful, is it? No, but, 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 it, but it's a difficult aesthetic for a lot of people to, to swallow. So, um, for example, I like weeds growing out of every nook and cranny, but my wife doesn't. So um, then I've, so, so yeah, there's, that's definitely a, a challenge, I think. But um, again, that's, isn't, that's kind of, that's, that kind of ties back into this this shift in this baseline of this aesthetic i think but yeah I, th I think it i think it does it's a challenging for the aesthetic for sure yeah and charlotte um presumably you have one of the tougher cells um along with jelaine in your 
when you're in very much in tone um, in terms of maintaining aesthetic against applying nature to your design. Yes, um, we do. But there are things you can do. Um, as I say, we use quite a lot of gravel where we can. We do a lot of planted rills. We've made it very much a signature of our design. So rills of stone into gravel or planting into stone or planting into gravel, not using anything particularly special, a bit of galley moderatum or um, baby's tears or thyme or whatever, but it does actually int introduce more um, planting and it is definitely part of our design aesthetic, but I think Ben's right, it is really difficult. Um, and I wouldn't be true to myself if I did a garden that I really didn't like to look at. Equally, if the client doesn't like it and you've stuffed up really, because they're the ones paying the bills. But I think you can meld the two. Okay, so we've got a number of questions that have come in. I've taken a note of a couple of them, but I'm, I'm just trying to tra trail through. Um, I think it's probably prudent that you all open your mics now and chip in as you um, see fit for the last 15 minutes. We had a question which Matt um, spoiled terribly by <laughs> bringing up early. Um, which was, what's the panel's position on concrete? Um, and, you know, presumably, where, where do you feel environmentally? Because obviously, it does form a, a substantial part of most construction works. Can I answer it first, then? Because I brought Yeah, yeah, up. yeah, you can answer it first. <laughs> well, this is really apt for me at the moment, because um, I've just finished a scheme where I work with some architects on a pool and pool house, um, and then there's all the landscaping. Um, and as part of this scheme, there is a, aesthetically a beautiful big concrete disc as a, a terrace with a cantilevered swimming pool, which is all made from concrete. There was a lot of concrete used on this site. Um, I am really true to the aesthetic and what was being achieved because it answered the client's brief in terms of what they were looking for. Very much a grand design looking thing and the, and the, the architects have delivered that for me. Where my role I felt then was really important was a role of mitigation. So in order for this garden to kind of be something that I could live with from a sustainable point of view, we were blessed with lots of Westmoreland stone already on site that you can't now quarry um, and very much a, a natural setting surround it. So everything else I did was I put in a big natural pond, I put in, I used, reused all of the stone from site, minimized waste that, you know, was leaving site. So I really felt that somehow I helped to mitigate that, that other design aesthetic, which was the concrete element within the garden. So I don't think we should, it, it's a good product concrete. You know, it, is, it works very, very well for a number of different uses, but I think we then need to think about what our responsibility is from a carbon footprint print point of view and how we can help mitigate that with other elements in the garden. <coughs> oh, a carbon offset almost. Yeah. Um, we, we do quite a lot of polished concrete or terrazza floors for gardens. I mean, we're, I think, I don't know, other designers do. We, we, it's quite a big signature of ours. But again, I agree with what Matt's saying. I mean, we did a big job in Oxfordshire where they were digging out, you know, into the land, there was, there was an old bungalow there. They were replacing it with a new build architect designed house um, and going quite deep down. And we, in that garden, we had to create a very large area of paved area with water and planting. We used polished concrete there because it, it really well, went well with the polished concrete inside and we know how to design into that. But a lot of the spoil from the house, well, most of the spoil from the house was turned into buns in the landscape. We created, because there was a bit of screening issues at the end of the site, there was a public footpath with amazing views beyond. So we were able to create buns or slight landforming that hid, the, the gave privacy to the client, but allowed the view to go through. So we, I think we saved something like 30,000 quid just by not taking that off site as well. So I think, yes, you just have to mitigate. And actually think about, I, I don't see that if you've got a quarry stone that, could be left in the ground. I don't see it's any worse or better to do polished concrete, to be honest. So, any, Jelaine or Ben, do you have any any positions on uh, the use of concrete? Oh, I, I think I agree with Charlotte on that. In that, you know, 
concrete is still a natural product. It's not like it's a plastic product. It is still a natural product. And, you know, what is the carbon footprint for that opposed to bringing in, you know, stone from China, for example. So, and also I think Matt's hit it on the head really with mitigation. Um, so if you have a client who doesn't like gravel, as Charlotte's pointed out, a lot of people don't want to have that trodden through their house or spilled out under a pavement, whatever. Um, does that mean that they can't have a patio? Well, no, of course they can. But, you know, if you have to put the concrete down, if you have to take away that soil and that drainage through, then yes, you have to do something to help mitigate that within the planting, perhaps, or the water management, or you know, whatever you can. Um, we did a, in fact, I was working with Ben with this actually on a project in, um, in NW5, which is a little town garden in um, um, Belsize Park. And, you know, we kept as much as we possibly could on site, which was tight, you know, it was a tight garden. It was a small urban garden and it was really tight, but we kept as much of the rubbish on there that we could and broke it up and used it as hardcore. Um, we used a lot of recycled slate, which came from um, CD depot, I think in Thurrock, so it was fairly local to the site. Um, everything was recycled. We hardly bought anything new. Um, and that sort of offset the amount of concrete that we had to put down, I felt. Um, but it would be very helpful if someone could give us a nice little calculated program, yeah. that's an app. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you can put in like, I've used this much concrete, I've used this much recycled material, you know, and just work out what your carbon footprint was. It would be very helpful. Yeah. Ben, you got a position? There has been a recent calculation that I think I saw this the other day that the production of concrete is something like the third if the, if, if, if the concrete production was a nation, it'd be the third largest polluter in the, on the planet or something like that. It's a massive con um, carbon footprint, this product. Um, and if you put on top of that all the, you know, we use loads of, we lo use loads of cement. So if you put that in, the, sorry, cement production. So if you, if you, and it's all wrapped up in plastic, you know? Because the because that's what the demands are on on the contractor really you know you've got to store loads of, you know you've you've got to build a you've got to do a certain job and you've got to you've got to keep your product dry you've got to do it to the best of your abilities and if we receive something from a designer it's got a specification on how we're going to install this and you would hope that every contractor was um, was quoting competitively so I would love to start using alternatives um, and I, and. I have an alternative on the radar, which is hempcrete. Never used it. Don't really know anything about it. I was hoping that maybe somebody would would enlighten me on this product. Um, I'd be fascinated to know more about this product. Um, I learned I learned of it through permaculture. Also, to add to that, I would say there's, and I've not I've not researched this, but um, I've heard that there is a possibility that certain cement products can sequester carbon rather than kick it out so actually and i think that occurs whilst it's in the ground it's drawing carbon in um can anybody else shed any light on that for me i don't know enough carbon I don't know sump. sorry like a carbon sump yes absolutely yeah and also somebody's telling me about um, clay pavers that can also do this but um i might have been you jelaine i don't know you might have been yeah. So, um, I agree, but I don't remember. so it's up to us, I think, to, to start to start sort of specifying these things, knocking on the knocking on the doors of suppliers and saying um, and, and, and people that make these products and saying, what can we do? Can we get this into? Can we can we feed these these products into the mainstream? Because um, I think the continued use of cement is one of the biggest issues in construction. And of course, when you're making concrete with cement, you're excavating um, fines as well to, to bulk it up. So there's, there's the, the land use for that purpose. Um, I can't trail back right to the very beginning of the questions, unfortunately, but I recall Mr. Richard Gardner asking a question about, if you'd answer this as succinctly as possible, please, because time is rolling on. Um, do any of you use eco, check sheets or um, you know almost like give yourself a point scoring system for your eco successes on the gardens that don't require um, planning consent for you know have an element where it's legal responsibility 
is it something that you address in that way? No, I haven't done that. Something you would consider? I've started to bring it into um, into the CDM process. So this, uh, at the start of um, planning a garden, yeah. And does and does it help? Um, well, it's it helps us to make design choices. Yeah. Um, whether those design choices then get taken up by the client, mm. um, it, it, it's it's not always the case, but um, it. it there's, there's two ways that we work. We either design our own gardens or we work with designers and we can we, we feed back to designers on certain things if they if they want that kind of reciprocal relationship. Or we will use this process to um, make our design decisions. Delaine, Matt, do you have anything? Sorry, go on, Ben. I was going to go on, carry on, sorry. Delaine and Matt, do you have anything to add on? The way you do almost like a, a checklist style approach to yeah, I sort of do I mean it's not it's not um, it's not anything that's ever been downloaded from the internet or has got any kind of credence to it but it is just my own spreadsheet of pros and cons of what I'm doing with this particular design um, and yes so I, I will put in the square meterage of concrete that's going in but I don't quite know how I can offset that carbon footprint I don't I haven't got the knowledge to do that mm -hmm. um, but then on my pros will be the amount of trees that I'm going in or the or whether we've got a wildlife pond going in so I sort of keep a pros and cons list and I always make sure that the pros outweigh the cons so that's just my own personal way of working. Mm. Matt well, anything so similar? Might focus on a moral approach really a moral obligation I don't have anything but I would like something more structured and I think that's what I was talking about before and maybe this needs to come from within the industry. So if you think about show gardens or you think about the SGD awards, maybe there needs to be a higher, um, a higher emphasis on the sustainability of, of projects. And, and maybe that is a, a, something which, you know, gardens are judged against so that we start, mm. to, so that we start to appreciate the value of sustainability more. And with my marketer's hat on, as I said, you know, I really think this is a huge commercial opportunity as well. So if you're able to turn around and say, you know, this, this beautiful garden I've designed is also doing a great thing here for the planet and everything, you know, I think that's a, it's a really, it, it's a real positive, I think, to help you sell your business and what you do. Are there too, are there too many, if we're looking to... Um, guidance from industry bodies are there too many conflicting interests going on in the industry bodies themselves because they have suppliers designers all these you know co co coming on come on under the one banner it might be difficult for for industry bodies to um well i think i think you're i think you're right because you look at futurescape for example you know when you have the the show you have a whole range of different suppliers there charlotte mentioned um our artificial grass you know we know there's a whole range of different suppliers there are we expecting the industry to be kind of shunning some of these other products or is that not the right approach i, I part of me really feels like it's, it's a very delicate um line to tread because what i don't want sustainability to become again is how i felt about it at the very beginning of my career which was as it being something that was worthy something that was hippie something that wasn't kind of you know going to be a, it was a barrier I kind of want it to be something which is organic, something which is positive, fun, and you know we shouldn't be um, turning it into something which is a sustainability restriction. So basically, if anybody's watching as an app developer, a, ca a carbon footprint offset yeah. app would be yeah. a really useful thing yeah. for all That'd of us. Right. Like a no-brainer. Um, we've all got a moral responsibility for the materials we use. And um, everybody seems to be, whether very consciously or subconsciously, basically applying those principles and trying to offset anything they know to be damaging with something positive. Plastic has come up a number of times. So I, I, I'll ask for what, a 10 second comment from each of you on plastic. But also, do we need to, and it's just been raised there, do we need to get our professional bodies to work together with a program um, which has the environment as its number one priority 
and can enable people to better understand damaging materials, damaging resource, um, distance traveled, not just for materials, but for plants, whether we're using peat, all of these factors. Um, there was a question on peat, by the way, if you want to buy peat free grown plants, you can buy them from me. There's, uh, there's my little plug. <laughs> and Gernard's Nurseries, we produce everything in peat. Plug. <laughs> um, but yes, yeah, so where do we, um, where do we see plastics as, a, as an obstacle? Is it something that we can work around or is it something that we um, are um, in real trouble with? For a five to 10 second answer, please, Carmen. Sorry, I got distracted. Say again. <laughs> Plastic, is it a problem? Are we able to recycle? Very yeah, no, it is a problem. And what I'm really pleased actually, we're now buying our bulbs um, from one of the first companies to introduce the biodegradable plastic material. It's not plastic, it's the material that they provide their bulbs and so much better. I hate plastic, frankly. But, well, that's definitive and I like it. So Ben, plastic. Uh, let's let's, let's com keep complaining about it and phase it out. Yep, yeah, excellent. Jelaine. It has really no place in modern day life. We've got a lot of it, so any plastic that you do have to use should be recycled. And recyclable, yeah. Mm. And Matt, finally. It, it, it's pots, isn't it? For me, that's, the, that's, the, that's one of my biggest bugbears. And um, I think we did it with uh, shopping bags and supermarkets, so we should be able to do it within our industry as well. Brilliant. Right. Well, all that remains as we've slightly overrun is for me to thank the audience. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. And also to thank this wonderful panel of Charlotte Rule, Ben West, Jelaine Rickards and Matt Childs. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>